what I'm going to talk about is uh, a way of doing machine learning that's called destructive. Can you hear or can't hear? Okay, maybe a little bit closer, okay. Um, so it's uh, a form of machine learning we call destructive uh, machine learning, but it's also destructive deep learning. So let's see what that is. So imagine you have a set of Lego blocks, a big basket filled with Lego blocks, and I give you some structure, let's say a tower, right? For instance, on the right. And I ask you to recreate this tower using this basket of Lego blocks. So how would you proceed? So one way to do this is a constructive approach where you would say, okay, let me look at the tower and piece by piece construct the, the tower using the Lego blocks, right? So this is what you may think of as a constructive approach. You start from nothing and slowly construct the given structure, right? On the other hand, you may think about a destructive approach, which is what children <coughs> might do, like my three, a two and a half year old, where he may look at the tower and then dismantle it piece by piece, right? But if you make a note of what you have dismantled and how you have dismantled, then at the end of the process, you have enough information to reconstruct back the tower. So this is what many engineers do and sometimes even children, where they try to deconstruct something and try to build it back up. So this is what you may call destructive learning. And this is what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so most of machine learning is a constructive approach. What I'm proposing that we do is a destructive approach. So um, let's specifically look at the problem of density estimation. So in this problem, we um, are given n IID samples drawn from some distribution. And the goal is to recover the density of this distribution just from the n IID samples. Okay, and if I know the parametric family of this distribution, for instance, if it's Gaussian or multivariate, if it's multivariate Gaussian or mixture of Gaussians, then you could compute the log likelihood, maximize the log likelihood, and there are very good guarantees for these estimators, right? The problem is when I don't want to impose these stringent parametric assumptions. And so this is called non-parametric density estimation where I don't, um, so you have to make some assumptions, but I don't want to make very stringent parametric assumptions that the density lies in some specific parametric family, right? So this is actually a big open problem, or specifically it's an open problem to do this in a sample efficient way. Okay. The main reason is that on the one hand you have these parametric families where the sample complexity or the number of samples that you would need to estimate the density well would scale, let's say linearly with the number of parameters. But then the moment you go to these flexible function spaces that non-parametric density estimation folks care about, then these are so flexible, then the number of samples you need typically scales exponentially in the dimension. And even in our big data era, we, nobody is going to give us exponential in the dimension number of samples, right? And so we are in this problem where we want to do the non-parametric function density estimation, and we have these flexible function spaces, but they are too flexible. And on the other hand, we have these parametric families that are too stringent. So we really need something in the middle. And recently, there has been a little bit of progress in which people have started to use deep generative models, which are essentially using deep neural networks to get some amount of flexibility beyond the typical parametric families. But these are still parametric, but the number of parameters is so large that you can essentially think of it as a non-parametric uh, uh, family. Okay, so this is what is known as deep generative uh, models for density estimation, and I'll talk about it in the context of constructive and destructive learning. So let's look at how a constructive approach for density, density estimation would look like, and here again, I'm, most of it is uh, essentially gonna focus on these deep gener generative models that are in use in recent years. Okay, so how would a constructive approach look like? Right? So think back to the Lego block example, you start from nothing and then slowly you construct the given tower, right? So here, what does nothing mean? Think of some highly uninformative distribution, let's say some standard Gaussian distribution, right? Or uniform distribution. So I start with, let's say, standard Gaussian, and then I learn some transform, <coughs> let's call it G5, of this 
uh, what I'm calling base distribution or noise distribution or just some given distribution. I learned this transformation G5 so that this transformation of the base distribution starts to look like my data distribution. Okay? And typically this transformation is highly flexible. Imagine it's a deep neural network with some parameters phi and I l learn these parameters phi so that there's a goodness of fit from my transformation of my base distribution and the given data. Okay? And the way in which I define this goodness of fit, you may get different things like variational autoencoders, GANs, and so on. Okay? But this is still a constructive approach because I construct a, uh, a model for my data distribution by starting from essentially a given base distribution and transforming it so that it looks like my data distribution. So how would a destructive approach look like? Right? So a destructive approach is where you start from your data distribution and then think about a transformation, d theta, which transforms my given data distribution to noise or some given base distribution, like let's say Gaussian uniform distribution and so on. Okay? And again, I want this um, transform transformation function d theta to be highly flexible. Imagine it's a deep neural network, right? And again, I can learn these weights theta by comparing the transformation of my data distribution to some given base distribution, let's say Gaussian, right? So in some sense, this is much simpler comparison than let's say likelihood. But then I look at this comparison and then I fit these weights theta. And so this has also been studied. So specifically when I start with the Gaussian distribution, right? And so I'm calling this destructive learning because essentially I'm taking my given data distribution and transforming it into a highly uninformative distribution, right? Like Gaussian or uniform. And so specifically in the early 2000s, people have looked at this and they called it Gaussianization, where I take my given random vector and my goal is to come up with a transform, transformation function, which transforms my given random vector to a Gaussian random vector. Okay, so that's the goal. And there's been a whole bunch of work, and actually, um, if you look at some of the projection pursued literature in the 80s, um, he has also essentially had these ideas um, of how to transform um, a given random vector to start making it look like a Gaussian random vector. And recently, people um, have started essentially using deep neural networks to come up with these transformations. Okay? But the, you can't just use any deep neural network, however, because ultimately remember that in the Lego block example, you do not just care about dismantling the tower. You need to do this in an invertible way, right? because after dismantling it, you have to reconstruct it back. So your transform d theta has to be invertible for it to be useful. right? Because what is d theta? It takes your data distribution and transforms it to a Gaussian, right? So if I want a sample from my data distribution, right, you take the Gaussian and apply the inverse of your destructive transform, and then you would get your estimate of the data distribution. So you need to have an this destructive transform be invertible. And so in the context of neural networks, you have to worry about your neural network transform to be invertible. Okay? And what's more, even if it is invertible, you, it's for computational reasons, you would want this inverse to be computable efficiently. So you need to start worrying about the Jacobian of your destructive transform. Okay, so th this is why you have a whole bunch of these um, papers that have carefully constructed <coughs> um, these destructive transforms. Okay, so this is where we are. Again, this is to summarize the constructive approach and the destructive approach. And what I'm proposing we do is a destructive approach, okay? And again, just to um, again uh, summarize what we have looked so looked at so far, um, in a destructive approach to density estimation, we take our given data distribution, and then we try to come up with a transformation that destroys the information in the given data. Right? So essentially, transforms it to a something highly uninformative, okay? And I want to do this in an invertible way because then I can um, um, apply the inverse of my destructive transform to the uninformative based distribution 
to get essentially an estimate of my data distribution, right? So this is where we are, and the existing set of, um, so um, some of the, um, the papers that I mentioned are from the last year or so, right? So this is still uh, uh, s stuff that's been going on very recently. So there is a lack of systematic theory, right? So we essentially, there's still an element of art as to how do I construct good destructors. So because again, I remember that you want this to be invertible, you want the Jacobian to, uh, um, if, you do, uh, if uh, it's not clear what I mean by Jacobian, just imagine that the inverse should be computable efficiently, right? Um, so essentially things are still a little bit ad hoc. We don't have a good theory for constructing good destructors, right? Yeah. Yes, so autoencoders are what I call a constructive approach. Um, so in autoencoders, you go from the Gaussian to uh, um, the data distribution, but then you also have an inference network, and that's how you fit the um, an inference network that goes from essentially the um, data to the uninformative base, and you fit both at the same time. Yes. Um, so those are essentially, these guys are essentially building these encoders that are invertible. So the only issue is, yes, so only issue is that you want this to be invertible. That's the, um, so these guys are uh, essentially building them. Um, right. So again, these are essentially just, we are just learning these transforms, right, um, from essentially this base distribution to the data distribution. And what I'm, what I'm uh, um, encouraging us to think about is to think about this in one direction specifically where you take the data distribution and then you try to convert it to, let's say, Gaussians, right? So, and this is what we provide. And so if you just think about it as just learning this transformation, there's no reason for you to directly fit a complicated destructive transform as a whole, right? Imagine that in your arsenal, you only have a not so good destructor, right? So imagine you have a shallow destructor, like in the context of density estimation, it would be some shallow density estimation procedure, right? Um, and then, is that good enough? Now, it's not gonna be good enough to directly transform the data that you have to a Gaussian, right? But it can destroy some information. So use this shallow destructor that you have, destroy some information, Right? And then after that, you still have something, but the amount of information has reduced. So again, apply a shallow destructor, destroy a little bit more information, and you keep doing this, and essentially a composition of these shallow destructors together would result in a nice deep destructor that would destroy a lot of information. Okay, so that's essentially what we propose, and this is something that um, is easier to analyze and also easier to implement. Okay, so let's look a little bit more formally as to what's going on. So if I have a set of, if, if I have a family of densities here uh, indexed by, let's say some parameter psi in some set capital psi. So given this family of densities, I'm gonna say that a set of transformations are um, destroy this family of densities. If given any, fam given any density in this family, right? then there exists a destructor that transforms this distribution to a uniform distribution, okay? And um, uh, the uniform distribution over the unit hypercube is the most uninformative distribution over the unit hypercube. It has a maximum entropy, okay? So essentially it's destroying all possible information. <laughs> and I'm also requiring that this family of destructors uh, is such that for any destructive transform, its inverse also exists in this family, okay? That's just uh, um, to flesh this family out. So essentially, if you just look at this, you can essentially think of this as some generalized whitening procedure, right? So in whitening, what you do is that you estimate the mean, you estimate the covariance, and then you remove those, right? You essentially destroy the first and second order moment information.
Whereas here, you're destroying more than that, right? You're destroying all possible moments here, essentially destroying all distributional information and converting it to a multivariate uniform random vector. Okay? So you can think of it as a generalized whitening procedure. And you can also think of this as generalizing the univariate CDF. So if I just have a single uh, dimension, if I have a univariate <coughs> random variable, a destructive transform is very simple. It's just very simply the univariate CDF, right? Because if you apply the CDF to the random vector, you're going to get a uniform random variable, right? So in one dimension, this is a very simple problem, solved problem. The trick, the, the tricky question is when you have a lot of variables and we do not have essentially a canonical way to destroy information, okay? So you can think of this, uh, um, essentially density destructors is trying to generalize the univariate CDF, um, at least as far as destroying information is concerned. Okay, and then I'm gonna uh, impose some additional um, um, conditions on this family of destructors. So I'm gonna assume essentially that <coughs> all these destructors have a canonical domain, again in the unit hypercube. Okay, and then um, that the identity transform exists in this class. The main reason is that with these two additional properties, I can now start talking about a composition of destructors, right? Because I can take one destructor, compose it with another destructor, and I can keep going on, and this composition of destructors will also be a destructor, <coughs> right? In the sense that it'll satisfy all these properties. Um, and in particular, you can essentially think of um, the set of destructors you would get by allowing for arbitrary compositions. Right? Essentially, you would get this group that would be generated by a given set of destructors that you have. Right? And in fact, if the inverse exists, you can just scratch this out. You can essentially take a family of destructors and then look at the group generated by this family of destructors under function composition. Okay? So this would be a much more complex set of destructors. And so this is essentially what we look at as our flexible function class. But this is not a function class for densities, it's a function class for destructors. Okay? And you're getting this by composing shallow destructors. Okay? And so here are some examples. Um, so um, recall the chain rule. So this holds true for any um, um, multivariate density. So if I have a set of random variables, x1 through xp, right, then its joint density I can always write down in this way. You have some ordering of the, the random variables, and then you look at um, the density of one variable given all the variables before it, right, and just take a product of all these conditional densities, right. This is exactly equal to the joint density. This is just the chain rule, right. And so what a very nice set of papers and what they call autoregressive flows uh, have done to essentially come up with a deep generated model is that they have taken this chain rule and so essentially these are just univariate conditional distributions, right? And so these they have essentially modeled as either Gaussian or a mixture of Gaussians, right? And so here if you think about since it's a conditional distribution, the mixture weights as well as the mean and the covariance are functions of the variables before them. And these are essentially uh, typically said to be very flexible functions, like let's say deep neural networks. Okay? So that's all these MADE and uh, MAF and so on. So why can I think about, how can I think about this as a transformation? Right? So think about the conditional distribution of Xs given the variables before it. You can essentially write it as this mean function plus the standard deviation times a standard Gaussian random variable, right? So essentially if I give you n, or in this case d, uh, standard Gaussians, you can then essentially use this recurrence to essentially uh, 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 compute x from these standard Gaussians, right? So you can essentially think of this autoregressive uh, um, flow as essentially transforming standard Gaussians to this much more complicated density, right? And then what is the corresponding destructive transform? 
it's actually not, s it's because it's just a product of essentially univariate conditionals, it's just the corresponding univariate CDFs, except that it would be conditional CDFs. Okay? So it's actually very simple. So you, you can use this to destroy information just by taking this product. Okay? So these are auto regressive flows that have again been proposed in the last couple of years. Um, but these are just one way to compute distractors, right? So, and these are clearly much uh, very complicated distractor. Let me give you a very simple distractor, right? So, what is a very simple um, uh, density? Um, so, uh, in the in the context of classification, regression, but also density estimation, you can have a shallow decision stump, right? A shallow decision tree, a decision stump, if you will, right? And so, imagine that I fit this. Um, tree-based density, right, and on the left, and then I can essentially transform this, so I, I can um, destroy the information in this, so that the the um, uh, this becomes a uniform distribution over the unit hypercube, just by um, modifying the rectangles. Okay, so essentially I can take. If, if my true density is specified by the left-hand side, it's very easy for me to destroy information, right? And so this would be, if I fit this shallow density, the right-hand side would be the corresponding inverse, okay? Um, so um, I'll have some more examples of other destructors, but given this, here is a very, very simple algorithm to actually learn a deep destructor using a composition of shallow destructors, which is a very natural greedy algorithm, right? What is a greedy algorithm? In each iteration, you fit the best possible canonical destructor. Actually, <coughs> you fit the inverse of the destructor, right? So you fit the density that's invertible, and it'll be a nice, simple, shallow density like a decision stump, right? Tree density. And you fit this, and then you destroy the information that you have actually learned, right? by computing the inverse, corresponding inverse inverse of the um, um, density that you have learned, essentially by applying the destructor, the shallow destructor, and then you keep repeating this till the distribution is close to uniform. It's this simple, right? And each of these steps is well understood, right? You don't need complicated engineering tricks to apply any of these steps. Um, okay, so how does this look like? So let's look at a very simple example here, um, this is the data that I have, right? So you can see that th th this is just 2D, but still you can see that the data is a little bit complicated, right? So if I, um, um, so it's essentially a bunch of concentric circles, right? So if I just fit a single Gaussian, it's probably not gonna work well, right? So uh, in the top panel, I'm essentially showing you the transformation of the data and ultimately, remember that I want to learn a destructor, so I want to take this data and make it look like uniform, right? So essentially, I want it to be as if I'm um, random points in the unit hypercube, right? So in the bottom panel, I'm showing you the estimate of the density, right? So how do I compute the estimate of the density? You take the destructive transform, invert it, and apply it to the base distribution, right? So we initially start with identity, and the base distribution is just Gaussian in this case, I think, and so this just looks like a Gaussian, right? But then in the next step, you can see that just from, uh, I forget what we used, I think a decision stump here. So you can see that it's destroying a little bit of information here, right? And then in uh, 15 iterations, it's destroying a lot more information, and then in 180 iterations, it's pretty much destroyed a whole bunch of information, right? And if you look at the corresponding uh, estimate of the density, initially it's just, you start with the Gaussian, but after 100 or so iterations, you can see that you have estimated the density very well. Right. And if you think about the computational cost, it's just 180 decision stumps, right? It's about the same cost as uh, um, um, some random forest implementation. Okay. So here is looking at it a little bit more in uh, detail, just to show you that things are, there's still a little bit of work that we need to do. So I have, essentially sh each panel corresponds to a different shallow destructor that we used in this greedy algorithm. 
Um, here, we just used, uh, I think, a mixture of a couple of Gaussians. Here, this was a very simple uh, density estimator, which just um, randomly computed a random linear projection of the data and then fit univariate Gaussians. Very simple uh, density estimator, right? And here, it, this is just a random tree, right? Just the decision stumps that I talked about. And so here, what you can see is that, um, uh, and again, the left side is the train um, and the right side is a test. So again, I'm showing you how well it's destroying information. And you can see that the train is much better than the test, in the sense that this destructive transform that you're learning is much, much better on the train than the test. Of course, we didn't run this for a lot of iterations, but it, at least it gives you a sense that it's overfitting slightly, right? Fine. Yeah. Um, it's overfitting slightly, and then you can also see that there is a varying performance <coughs> among the destructors, right? Maybe a mixture of two Gaussians is not that fantastic. Um, this is maybe less so. Uh, decision stumps, I would argue, seem to work the best. And um, so we applied this on MNIST and compared to a whole bunch of um, these recent uh, neural flow-based uh, algorithms. Uh, these are all the autoregressive flows <coughs> and other variants. And so we just looked at log likelihood and you can see that, so we uh, also looked at some copula-based uh, shallow destructors, um, random trees, and then this was something where we constructed a, a whole new destructor that I don't want to get into. The interesting thing is that we do much, much better than these much more complicated destructors that require fitting essentially in a sequential way a whole bunch of complicated uh, uh, neural networks, whereas these are essentially just 100 decision stumps, right? Very simple. Um, and you can get much, much better log likelihood, right? Um, so I'll just stop there. Um, so we essentially provide essentially this general framework for destructive learning where we focused on density estimation, but the same thing actually applies even to regression and classification. Right? Because there you just go from unconditional density estimation to conditional density estimation. You can still do all of the machinery that we talked about. We just focused on density estimation because um, that is somehow a much harder problem for uh, n some of these recent deep generative models. There are a whole bunch of open questions. We still don't have um, uh, all the theoretical analysis that we want. Right. So in other words, so you have this very nice and, uh, and simple greedy algorithm, but after t iterations, how close are you to this uninformative distribution? What is the sample complexity, right? So this will essentially depend on the flexibility of your function class. In this case, it's the uh, um, group of destructors that you get, right? The destructive deep learning group. Um, and also I mentioned a couple of caveats, right? So it seems that we do need to regularize the shallow destructors. Somehow it's very similar to boosting where if your weak learning algorithms are actually very, very flexible, then there's a small chance it might overfit. Uh, big chance it might overfit. And so that may be something what we are seeing, which is that decision stumps seem to be working pretty well. But uh, if I use something more complicated, it's not working so well. And the other thing is that maybe we can actually improve on the greedy algorithm. Um, that's the other thing that we are working on. Okay, I'll stop here. Thanks. Questions or comments? Um, is there any advantage in, for the density estimation problem? So the copula representation, you apply the probability integral transform to each coordinate separately, and so then all of the marginals are moved on, and then you bundle all of the complexity into the copula that is the, the multivariate mess, right? You could apply your destructive technique after doing that kind of whitening, just per univariate. Did you try that? Um, so it's we uh, um, used actually a copula density uh, uh, based destructor itself. So we tried that. Right. Um, but what you are saying is that just essentially compute these univariate marginals and just whiten the 
univariate marginals and then apply whatever we are applying. We do not do that. So essentially, it's one additional layer of just taking care of the marginals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, the appealing thing about the theorem is that you know, you've kind of got the separation of concerns then all of you know, the marginal information you've dealt with. Most of these shallow destructors, in some sense, estimate the univariate marginals effectively. Right. And so that's somehow already happening. Uh, that is one reason why we didn't focus on that. But maybe in a theoretical analysis, it might be helpful. Yes. Uh, extension to classification of classification does not uh, require that the classification, the loss function used for training is different from the loss function used for evaluation. It's around loss. So we have only thought about this as a um, conditional density estimation um, rather than uh, looking at some other loss functions. So you could use conditional density estimation for classification, like logistic regression, for instance. But uh, And in fact, in a lot of the ways in which we train deep neural networks, we essentially have these kinds of losses um, uh, that are essentially fitting conditional densities. Uh, but uh, yeah, but that's a good Good point. We haven't really thought about how do you extend this to a much more general decision theoretic framework where you just have some loss functions and you don't care about densities. Yeah, uh, yeah just wondering, so, so when you're talking about the constructive and descriptive approaches, you try to match two distributions, but in one case it's in the input space and in the other case it's in the data set. Input space. I mean, in the, in the space of where the data are uniform, mm -hmm. or in the space where the data are like the data. So my question is, what, when, is there a difference in the objective function? Like, somehow when you do some optimization, you try to match these two distributions yeah. into different spaces. So do you have a fundamental difference in the objective function you optimize when you do the two approaches? That could explain maybe the difference in the objective function. Right. Yeah, certainly, I mean, uh, in, at an abstract level, it's still both, in both cases, it's a divergence between distributions. But in the destructive case, it's somehow simpler because you're matching it to a Gaussian, let's say, which is a much simpler um, objective than, let's say, comparing my generative model distribution and the empirical distribution. So that's somehow more complicated. So you are, I think that's an interesting perspective, which is that the destructive approach might give you simpler loss functions. So that's something uh, worth thinking about. Um, that's right. Cool back library. Yeah, exactly. Right. You can think of other divergences as well. So more broadly, you have this divergence between two distributions. Um, but yeah, so somehow, actually, I, I didn't have much time, but the destructive approach is much simpler to think about. The main reason is that if I want to do things in a constructive way, then imagine that I'm learning a composition of functions. Right? Then if I want to construct things one by one, then it's you have to think about, let's say I have a composition of two functions and you have to match it to the true data distribution. That's going to be very bad. And in general, agnostic as estimation we are not very good at. So this is not going to be very good at. Whereas here, the destructive way is much simpler. Um, and um, where you're just destroying whatever information you can find. And so somehow, just theoretically speaking, it seems that we should be able to do better using the destructive approach. Um, but yeah, that's. OK, so let OK, <laughs> one good question. <laughs> so that, that would make any sense to combine this idea uh, with uh, like a ICA kind of idea so that once you make it separate, you just apply the CDA for the each ICA. Yeah, yeah, um, that's actually a very, uh, uh, in very um, uh, important observation, which is that you can essentially use this for nonlinear ICA, because um, uh, in nonlinear ICA, the main goal is also a transformation, where you transform your data into an independent distribution. But, but this has been done. Right. <laughs> nonlinear. No, I mean. Done yeah, I see eight by Gaussianization sets of values. There's a chain of Gaussian, but that's from the early 2000s. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So again, the Gaussianization uh, um, literature that I mentioned, it's actually, yeah, people have made the connection to I see.
Okay, so let's thank the speaker again and move on to the next.